Well, good morning. I want to give you a very warm welcome to our service this morning and just a few announcements as we begin. Uh, tonight is our evening service at 6.30 and we'll be continuing our series in the book of Colossians. And then on Tuesday evening, our prayer and Bible study at 8. And then on Wednesday, uh, the Silver Threads is back at 2.30. So that's 2.30, this starts the Silver Threads, uh, so uh, it'd be great to see you along at that. And some other announcements as well. There's an event uh, that is going to be run by Baptist Women, and I think we'll have a wee slide about that as well. And that's taking place on Thursday, the 14th of October. It's called Prayer, Praise and Promises, and it's going to be taking place over Zoom. Uh, so Thursday, 14th October at 8, and it's open to women of all ages at the theme More Than Conquerors with uh, Trilla Newbell, and she's preaching in Romans 8. So the cost for that is £5, and to register, you need to go on to the Irish Baptist Women website. So if you'd like any more details, please just uh, see us about that. But uh, you can see the details up there, but we'll announce that again, God willing, next week, just to refresh your memory about that as well too. And this morning is our harvest service. And so uh, rather than collecting uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, we've been collecting some things for the, the food bank, as you can see uh, in front of you there. And uh, we've previously given a list of some of the things that they need. So we want to thank each and every one of you for your very generous uh, contribution for the food bank. It's, it's good for us to have a time like this at our harvest service to pause and reflect on God's blessings even towards us, his goodness and to worship him. Psalm 107 is a psalm which urges us to give thanks to the Lord for he is good. It's a psalm that reminds us of, of different aspects even of God's goodness, God's goodness and guidance, God's goodness even in justice as well too. But I, I want to read a selection of verses in the, from this psalm reflecting on his care for us, uh, beginning to read at verse 31. And we're going to mention just a few verses in this psalm. Psalm 107 verse 31 says this, Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. And the psalmist goes on to say, Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Down to verse 35. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell. They establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. And then the very end of the psalm says these words in the last line. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. And that is what we're going to do this morning. To consider even God's goodness. We're going to begin our time singing this well-known hymn. We plow the fields and scatter. And its chorus reminds us, all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Then thank the Lord, oh thank the Lord. For all his love. Let's stand and give praise to the Lord together as we sing this hymn. We plow the fields and scatter the good seed on the land, but it is fed and watered by. God's almighty hand He sends the snow in winter The warmth to swell the grain The breezes and the sunshine And soft refreshing rain All good gifts around us Are sent from heaven above Then thank the Lord Oh thank the Lord for all Obey him, by him the birds are fed. 
much more to us his children he gives our daily bread all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above then thank the lord oh thank the lord for all his love we thank thee then oh father As we were singing there, let us give thanks to the Lord for his love. Let's come before the Lord together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, even for your gracious provision. For how you not only created this world, but also you sustain it by your mighty hand. How you uphold it even by your word of power. Lord, you send the sun that we can enjoy its warmth. You send the rain, Lord, even to to water the fields and the crops. And Lord, you have made all things, from the mightiest creature even in the ocean, to even the very smallest of insects as well. You made all things. And Lord, in you we live, move, and have our very being. And we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for the daily mercies even that you provide. We give thanks, Lord, even for the homes that we have, for the, the food that we eat. But Lord, we we thank you for this food that even has been gathered here today as we've collected this together. But we also pray for those who are in need. Those who have been so impacted even by this pandemic. Those who are struggling and finding it difficult even to, to make ends meet. We pray for those who are concerned over their families. Lord, we do pray even for the work of the food bank as we do seek to to give this this food that we've collected even towards that work. We do pray, Lord, that they would be able to to meet even the the physical needs of people. And as they do meet this physical need, may it lead even to that open door of opportunity, maybe even to, to minister to their greater spiritual need as well. Lord, we want to thank you that you have provided a savior through the giving of your son, Lord. And Lord, we give thanks for your gracious provision for that way of salvation that's been opened through Christ Jesus' sacrifice. And Lord, these last two years, while they have been even a, a, an unsettling and troubling period for many, but Lord, help us to remember that you are our hope in the midst of a, an anxious world. Lord, you are our rock, you are our refuge. And Lord, uh, we see reminders of your goodness each day even in the the very creation around us. And so, Lord, remind us of that even in these hymns that we sing today, in the passage even that we later study together. And, Lord, help us today to give thanks and to praise your excellent name, to recognize your, your good and your gracious hand. And, Lord, that every good gift we have comes from you above. We give you thanks for your steadfast love. And so, Lord, focus our thoughts upon you today. Lord, remind us of the the many reasons that we have to give thanks to you. And so, Lord, we commit this service into your hands. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Well, before we turn to God's word once again, we're going to sing another hymn which reminds us of how God is sovereign over all. He is the the very king of creation, the one who, who reigns and even tenderly cares for his people. 
um, but he also bids us to draw near and to praise him. This is praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. We'll just stay seated as we sing this. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. you could turn in your Bibles to Psalm 65. Psalm 65. And as you're turning that up, uh, as we're saying, the um, the collection today of the food is going towards the work of the food bank. And I meant to mention after uh, next, from next week, we will continue to collect items for the food bank each week as we did prior to lockdown. So there's going to be, uh, I think there's a box usually left in, in, in the hallway just regarding that. So we will do that from next week onward if anyone wants to, to give on going to the work of the food bank. Uh, so as you turn to Psalm 65, recently we've been looking at the life of David. And today I want to turn to this Psalm of Thanksgiving, which David wrote. And while we don't know the exact circumstances behind David writing this Psalm, there are some clues as you read it as to when it might have been used Uh, Some suggest maybe David's writing during one of Israel's harvest festivals, um, like maybe around the Feast of the Tabernacles. Others suggest maybe David's rejoicing um, after a harvest, maybe after a particular time of famine or difficulty. But whatever that circumstance, there are a number of really helpful reminders in this psalm for us to reflect on on our harvest service of the goodness of God. So let us read this psalm together, Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who hear prayer. 
to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. The one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with his might. Who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. So that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with bounty, with your bounty. And your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. And this is the word of God. Before we study this wonderful psalm together, we're going to sing another greatly loved hymn. This uh, is a hymn written by a man called Thomas Chisholm. And he wrote it not any, out of any particular dramatic uh, occurrence in his life, but simply from reflecting on God's goodness to him each day. Uh, Thomas Chisholm was a man from a very simple background, but he later wrote about the, this hymn that he reflected on uh, that he wrote years before. And here's what he said when he reflected back on it. He says, my income has not been large at any time due to impaired health in the later years which has followed me on until now. Although I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God and that he has given me so many wonderful displays of his providing care for which I am filled with astonishing greatness. You know, it is important for us to remember the unfailing faithfulness of God. So let's do that together as we sing this wonderful hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And when we stand, if you're able to, to change our positions.
as we come to prayer together, we do want to uh, pray for Francis. Uh, Francis Watterson was admitted to hospital on Friday, and I know the family would appreciate uh, your prayers at this time. Uh, just, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, that you are a faithful God, that you do your mercies, Lord, even towards us are new every morning. Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for just the many ways in which you bless us. So many things often we take for granted as well. Father, forgive us for those times. But Father, help us even as we seek to praise and honor you today. Lord, we do pray even about the needs of our assembly. We do pray for Francis at the moment, for the the doctors and the nurses, even as they attend her and treat her. Lord, we do want to give you thanks for the wisdom and skill even that you've given our medical staff. And Father, we do pray for them. We pray that they will be able to diagnose what is happening in, in Francis's body. And Lord, I pray, Lord, uh, even in the midst of this anxious time, Lord, that you would comfort her with your presence, Lord, that you would uh, minister her, to her even through your word. And Lord, may the promises that she reads there, Lord, even sustain her and encourage her as they have been, Lord, even in recent days, as she's been even sitting reading her Bible, Lord, as well. May that have been a help, Lord, even to her, and just speak to her, Lord, through it. We do pray for our children and the extended family as they are concerned about her. And, Lord, may they be assured, Lord, that she is in, in your hands and that you are a faithful God. Father, we do pray for others who are uh, concerned about uh, loved ones, for brothers, for cousins, parents, and grandparents. Lord, we pray that you would speak into each and every one of these circumstances. And Lord, for those who don't yet know you, that you would challenge them even about how they stand before you. And Father, for those not well who are your children, Lord, uphold them each day. For those going through treatment, Lord, even at the moment, we pray for them and we ask that you would bring healing, Lord, even to their bodies. That you would... Just sustain them each day. May they know of your abiding presence with them, Lord. And so, Lord, may may we know of that presence here with us. Lord, we do pray, Lord, that you would minister to us now, even through your word. Speak to us afresh. Cause our hearts, Lord, even to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn our Bibles, please, once more to Psalm 65. (laughs) Psalm 65. You know, where is it that you find your joy? The late Scottish preacher, uh, Alexander White, he observed that sometimes we tend to hang heavy weights onto the thinnest of wires. And what he meant is that sometimes we hang our happiness on sometimes fragile things that can so easily and quickly be taken from us. Things like our health, things like even friendships, or jobs, homes, or possessions. These are all good blessings from the Lord, but they're an inadequate foundation for lasting joy, as these things are all sometimes certain and transitory as well. They can be passing and fleeting. Rather, Alexander White wants us to to fix our eyes on the one who is certain, and the one who will endure forever. And you know, the psalm that we're looking at today helps us to do that. David was a man, when you think about it, who who knew what it was to have many things in his life taken away from him. Uh, When Saul turned against him, he, he lost his home. He effectively became a man on the run, seeking refuge wherever he could. He lost his position, even as commander of that army. He lost even his wife, Michael. And yet, despite this David endured because he was fixing his eyes on one who remained faithful. And this morning, David, through this psalm, is going to help fix our eyes on the goodness of God. And whatever circumstance you're going through this morning, I pray David's encouragement will be a help to your life as well. That would enable us even to give thanks to God, even in the midst of trial. I'm going to split this psalm into three parts, really, this morning. And the first part is from verse 1 to 4. And we're looking at how 
the goodness of God is manifested in that the fact that he is the gracious God. He is the gracious God. The psalmist begins by directing his praise to God in Zion. He says, praise is due to you, O God, and to you shall vows be performed. Our God, in other words, is one who is, is worthy to be praised, the one to whom worship is due. And, you know, Zion was the place that uh, David had captured. Uh, the hill in Jerusalem where later the temple would stand, a place that was symbolic of, of God's very presence even with his people. Zion was the place where people came to, to worship the Lord, to bring their offerings of thanksgiving to him, the place where they would perform those vows of worship. And we know, of course, that we can worship God anywhere. We don't have to uh, go to this place, Zion. But uh, Jerusalem and Zion was that place appointed by God to be uh, the worship where the children of Israel were were to go, were to gather together. And uh, that was the place that was appointed by God. And the the, the picture here, the psalmist is, is directing our attention to there, not because of the place, but because of the God who sustained it. He's directing our attention to God himself. His thoughts are turning to the thought of people coming to worship the Lord together. And what a blessed thing that is. To sing praises to God together. To give offerings to God together. Even as we have been doing here today. God's people, he's reminding us, have a reason. Always even to praise God. Because it's fitting, it says, that he receives worship from us. And why is this? How is he a gracious God? Well, the remaining verses in this little section tell us of that. Verse 2 shows us God is gracious in answering prayer. If you want a little subheading to write underneath that, that is God's grace in answering prayer in verse 2. Do you know, David in his life, had, he had proved this glorious truth, that he worshipped the God who hears and answers prayer. Because God had delivered him from the hands of the, the Philistines, we saw that. God had also, uh, he'd find refuge and protection in God, even in the midst of Saul's unceasing pursuit. Think of the number of times that Saul was drawing close to David, and yet again, God answered prayer by delivering David. God is gracious, though, in hearing and answering the prayers of, of all his people. And we can turn to him at all times with our, our worries and, and cares. You know, what a blessing that is. To be able to turn to God at all times. You know, maybe over this period of of the pandemic period, you've maybe grown a little bit frustrated. Maybe sometimes where you weren't maybe always, if you had an issue, whether that be with something in your, your bank or whatever it is, that sometimes some of the places weren't always open. That you could actually go and seek help and you had to instead turn to these helplines. And usually the frustration was called when you dialed one of these numbers, you'd, get the, you'd pick it up and the next thing you'd hear, I'm sorry, all our lines are closed. Please come back tomorrow. You know, you, how many times have you got that over this period? Or sorry, you phoned and you've got through to the wrong department. You need to get to someone else. And then they direct you to somewhere else again. It's frustrating, isn't it, when we get that? But our God, we can turn to him at all times. And he's not going to turn and say to us, sorry, I'm too busy now. Or or, sorry, I can't help you with that. No, our God is all present. He is all powerful. And he wants us to seek refuge in him alone. To bring our burdens before him. to, To talk to him. To tell him of our worries, our fears, even our frustrations. He wants us to know we're not alone. To know that we can talk to him at all times. But the psalmist also longs that all flesh would come and, and worship the Lord. That we would recognize him as the Lord. That, that, that they too, all nations would, would worship him. That they too would find this refuge that David had proved in his life. That they would know this joy of this communication and fellowship with God. All flesh should seek him because he is the Lord of all all owe their very existence to him. If people would recognize that he, who he truly is, then surely they would come to him. Do you know that's something the prophets later would write about? And Isaiah 2 speaks of how the latter, on the latter days, it says, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be exalted. All nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come saying, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and walk in them. These latter days, speaking even of the coming of God's Messiah, Jesus. 
How when he came and proclaimed even that message of the kingdom, that promise began to be fulfilled. People from other nations did indeed come and also worship the Lord. Remember the Samaritan woman, her conversation with Jesus? And she wanted to know, uh, where, where should we go and, and worship the Samaritans, worshiped on a different mountain? And you know, she wondered, where, where, what place should we go to? And Jesus told her this in John 4, 23. The hour is coming and is now here. In other words, the moment when he came into this world and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. You know, what a wonder is that the whosoever will can approach the living God and worship. That we can come to the very creator. That we can submit, when we submit to his truth and come even in the spirit of faith, that we can have this wonderful communication with him. You know, as the gospel of Jesus Christ continued to spread through the early church, many from all different nations did indeed come to worship the Lord. And many more are still being gathered in today as that seed continues to be sown. You know, I wonder, do we, though, give God rightly the praise that is due to his name? You know, in our prayer life, do we just come and and treat our prayer life like a a shopping list? You know, it's right to bring our burdens before the Lord. Yes, it is. It's right to do that. But do we ever stop and and give thanks and just simply worship and uh, adore the Lord? For his continued blessing. Do we ever just pause and reflect. Of God's grace in each circumstance. The psalmist can praise God you see. For the grace found in answered prayer. And he bids others to to come and also. Pray and worship the Lord. But you know God displays his grace in another way. Look at verse 3. Here we see God's grace and forgiveness. God's grace and forgiveness. See, as David reflected back in his life, he thought and he recognized times of faults and failings. Times maybe when he didn't acknowledge the Lord as he should or seek the Lord as he should. Times where he let the Lord down and he recognized his own unworthiness. You know, and I think this is one of the true marks of a, of a godly man. That they're often, the most godly people maybe that you know are often some of the most humble Because the more you draw close to a holy, perfect God, the more you love him and the more you know him, you realize even of your own unworthiness, even to come to him. And you can give thanks to him for his grace, even that he bids us to do that. And David says, when iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgression. You know, that word uh, iniquities refers to the concept of one who who has gone astray and doing something forbidden. Or even ignoring something that has, uh, should be required. So he could reflect maybe David in his, his thought life. Even the things he had said. The actions he had done. Things he regretted. And he says as he thought of this. Lord it's like the, these, my iniquities at times seem to overwhelm me. When I think of my own unworthiness. But he responds with thanksgiving. Lord you atone for our transgression. The sins that once separated David from the Lord, the the guilt that once affected his relationship with the Lord. He confessed and acknowledged his sin to the Lord and sought his forgiveness. And so the Lord graciously atoned for those transgressions. What does atone mean? Well, atonement literally means, well, it actually helps if you split the word up, at one mint. It means to bring about a a reconciliation between, between two different parties. To make even amends for a wrong. It's a rich biblical word. And atonement as it's used in scripture. Atonement, that reconciliation comes about through means of the offering of a sacrifice. And God himself is the only one who can atone. He's the only one who can forgive and cleanse. Because that's who we wrong when we sin. And God had given his people Old Testament sacrifices. In the Old Testament period, these sacrifices, ways that they could atone for their sin. But those sacrifices needed to be repeated. But through Christ Jesus, he was the ultimate sacrifice. All of these were pointing their way to him. The one who would atone for our sin. That was a once for all sacrifice. It does not need to be repeated. That is available to all who would come to him in faith and belief. And what a gracious God that he bids the sinner to come to him. Who gives this way of access. Who provides a way that sin can be forgiven. Enabling us to approach a holy God. 
And so he says in verse 4, Blessed is the one you choose to bring near and dwell in your courts. So God is gracious, we've seen in answering prayer. God is gracious in forgiving sin. But fourthly in verse four, or sorry, thirdly in verse four, he, to know that God has chosen us and invites us to come near. Here we see grace and fellowship. Grace and fellowship. See, salvation is of the Lord. It is by his grace alone, not of our own merit. And what a, a blessing, what a privilege that we can come to the almighty God, that we can come to him and have this access to him. You know, imagine how privileged you would feel if, you know, uh, when we have some of these royal visits, if the queen maybe has give you your card. I don't think the queen has business cards, by the way, but if, if she gave you your card and said, there's my private number, you can phone me at any time, how privileged would you feel? You'd be going around, you'd be showing it to people. Well, maybe you wouldn't because otherwise they get the number, but you'd be saying to them, look what I have. The queen said I can call her any time. Isn't that amazing? But yet, we have access to the sovereign ruler over all. We can talk to him whenever we wish. He's involved in, uh, and interested in every aspect of our lives. And we can approach the Almighty One, the Holy One. And we don't approach him as, a, as an equal, of course, no, because he is the eternal God, the Almighty, all-knowing God. We humbly come to him. We humble ourselves before him and acknowledge his greatness but what a privilege that he bids us to come. That we who are sinners saved by God's grace, that he welcomes us in. That he bids us to have this fellowship with him, to come and worship him, to come and even share with him of our, our cares and our troubles even as well. I want you to notice also in verse 4, what, what a privilege you see that is, but notice the expectant faith in verse 4. He says, not only is the child of God blessed, but he says, we'll be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. Do you know the rest of this, this psalm is going to say more about God's goodness and about how he makes this known to his people. Our God is good, our God satisfies, and we should long to spend time in his presence. Because what a privilege that is. How many times maybe do we neglect maybe that privilege in our life? Could it be, like Alexander White talked about at the, the start of our message, about that we've been sometimes consumed with earthly fleeting pleasures, that we've forgotten to spend time even talking to the one who is infinite, to invest our life and in even things of priority to the kingdom of God? You know, could it be that this is what has been, been guilty of in our lives, that we've maybe just spent time in a quick prayer during the morning, without maybe even pausing during the day, just to even give thanks for just some simple thing that God has given us. You know, maybe as you're listening to this or watching this today, you don't know this sense of blessedness and satisfaction in God. But you can't truly really know the blessing of God and the joy of forgiveness until you come and know that he has made atonement for your sin. He's opened the way of salvation that you can come to him. It's something, you know, he bids us to approach. That way of salvation is open. Christ paid that debt. But what he requires us to do is humble ourselves before him. Admit our great need. That we are sinners. That we need to be forgiven. And praise God he bids us to come. Forgiveness is possible in Christ Jesus. Do you know, but we see in this psalm God's goodness displayed. We've seen God's grace, first of all, in verses 1 to 4. But let's uh, look at not only is he the gracious God, but verses 5 to 8, we see he is the mighty creator. Verses 5 to 8, he is the mighty creator. David reflects on all that God has done, and he says, By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. Do you know, people today sometimes use this word awesome in a, a kind of a weak sense of that word. I once knew someone and you would ask him, well, how, how was your holiday? Oh, my holiday was awesome. It was absolutely, it was brilliant. Awesome. How, how was your day? What, what, what did you do then? Um, did, weren't you going out in the football match? Oh, it was awesome. We had a brilliant time at it. We're, you know, we won. It was fantastic. We used, sometimes people use that word awesome in the sense of, oh, wasn't it great? 
Wasn't it brilliant? But in the biblical sense of this word, if you're, if you're looking in the authorized, it actually translates it as terrible deeds. You see, the word awesome here is talking about a, it's a reverence and awe. It's a reverence and awe. It's reflecting in some of the amazing ways that God has displayed his great power to his people. It's standing in awe, like standing before um, even a, a great sight, even of God's creation. Standing and being in awe, even of what God has done. Awe and worship as well. So the psalmist here is reflecting in verses 5 to 8 of some of the incredible and amazing ways that God has displayed his great power. He's displayed his righteousness to him. How is, has God done that? In, in David's mind, when David thought of awesome deeds of righteousness, what would he have thought of in the history of his people? What about the Exodus as an obvious example? He delivered his people from the hands of the Egyptians. He sent these plagues into the land. He led and guided his people by a pillar of, a pillar, sorry, of fire and cloud. He even parted the seas so that the, the, his people would cross. He used those same seas to enclose even upon Israel's enemies. He truly was the God of their salvation. But this God of salvation is the hope of all the ends of the earth and the farthest seas. Do you know, in the, in the ancient times, you see, there was some uh, pagan cultures, they, they thought that there was maybe gods for different places. That's what some of these pagan cultures thought. The Babylonians, for example, had uh, Marduk they worshipped. Others had Baal. But the psalmist is saying here that God isn't one in a, in a line of many gods. No, he is the God of the universe. He is the only true God. He's the hope of all the ends of the earth. He's the only one that deserves our worship. All others, he says, are false gods. There's no part of this universe, you see, that God doesn't have claim to. It's not just that he was the, the God uh, who reigned over Israel. He was the God of the whole earth because he made it. There's not a part of the earth where he can't lay claim to and say, that's mine. God's rule extends over all, and he displays this mighty power in his creation. Verse 6, by his strength he established the mountains. Now, when you stand in front of a great mountain, it's a humbling thing. It is because you feel so small standing beside this great mountain. You're probably saying to yourself, Neil, you're, you're, you're small even at the best of times when I stand before someone in the street. But, you know, but when you stand in front of a great mountain, when you see the vastness of this, the sheer scale of it, you just feel like an insect beside it sometimes. You really do. You know, when you see the mountains even, and whenever David thought of the mountains, you know, the mountains were a symbol of, of permanence and stability. Why? Because whenever the storms came along, whenever the winds may blow, no matter how hard they may blow, he knew, David, when he got up in the morning, would know that that mountain's not going anywhere. That mountain wasn't going to disappear overnight, even in the midst of the storm. And here we, he's reminding us that even the mighty mountains, they owe their very existence to God. That thing of great power, that great symbol of power and stability, that great symbol of security, God made that. Even he's the one who uh, stills the most troubled of seas. You know, even when you, if you've been to the, the beach on a, on a stormy day, seen the great power of the seas. Maybe even you've seen some of those scenes of, of floods or tsunamis even as well. You see even the power of the oceans. How even sometimes the mightiest structures can't stand against uh, those oceans like skyscrapers even and, and other bridges maybe there, I think there was Japan one time there was a great tsunami there and you've seen even this, these bridges being swept away yet God is the one who is able to still the roaring waves and if he can do that then surely he's the one who can calm even the tumult the, the, the roaring of the nations these awesome deeds and works of God were a witness to the nations around them look at verse 8 he is able to quiet the most turbulent of the nations, making those who dwell at the ends of the earth to be in reverent awe of your signs. That's the true sense of this word awesome, to be in awe of it. And this is what happened. Do you remember when the spies went in to spy the land of Canaan? When they met Rahab? And what did Rahab say to them when she hid the spies? She was able to tell them, you know, we've heard about God's dealings with you. We've heard how the Lord delivered you from Egypt. 
And here's what Rahab says. She says, I know the Lord has given you the land and the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away from you. For we've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea from before you came, when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were before Jordan. And as soon as we heard, our hearts melted. There was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. Rahab and the people, they saw what God had done in the nations, what God was doing through Israel, and they were in awe. They were in awe because they could see God moving. You know, oh, that God would, would look at us and see God moving in our lives. Maybe even in simple, ordinary ways. Maybe even how we respond to that time of trial. How people would say, how can that person keep on going? How can they stand amidst that difficulty? I know people who have been saved even through seeing others even go through even a period of bereavement. Just when they've been able to see how God was their refuge during that time. How that spoke to them as well. You know, God had spoke to the nations through Israel. Through even of what he had done for them. And people were in awe. You know, God was able to bring, even when you think of it, God still today speaks to the nations. He still speaks to the nations. Not just through his people, but even through his creation. You think he, how he's able to bring the busyness, even the industry of this world, to a standstill. Even with a microscopic virus. I don't presume to know the mind and will of God in this circumstance, but through this I know some were challenged about how they stood before God. Other saints during this time were called home to glory. And you know, the virus is still in this world until God says otherwise. And you know, it's maybe still here because maybe God still has more to say to us even through this time. To teach us even about the importance of, of gathering in together. To impress upon us about our need to depend on him. In the midst of changing times, to fix our eyes on the unchangeable God. And here he even says in the, in the psalm as well, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening shout for joy. Talking about when the sun uh, even comes out and rises in the east and even uh, sets in the west in the evening. The Lord is, brings shouts of joy to those who know him as creator, master and God. And while the nations tremble at what God does, the Lord's people are in awe. Because we know the things that happen in our world don't hinder God's timetable. No, they are in God's will. And they only serve to advance that timetable of God. To remind us even that his son is even coming soon. He's the gracious God. He's the mighty creator. But verses 9 until the end of the psalm, 9 to 13, he's the abundant provider. He's the abundant provider. He's the one who visits the earth and waters it. Now, there are times maybe in Northern Ireland we maybe wish that the land wasn't watered so well, but it is. Uh, there's so much rain even in our province as well. But we need that rain. If you were a farmer, you would be very dependent on that rain. You'd be glad to see the rain coming. How the rain helps the crops grow. How the wonderful lush scenery even that we have in our land owes even its, uh, just its flourishing to that rain that comes. The psalmist says the rivers of God is full of water. You provide the grain. You've prepared it. So we seldom think of the rain as a blessing, do we? We think of days like this where we see the sun and we're more thankful for those days. But actually, you know, whenever the promised land was given to the people, in Deuteronomy 11, uh, while he told them that the land was going to be a land of milk and honey, Here's what he also said, Deuteronomy 11, verses 11 to 12. The land that you're going over to possess is a land of hill and valleys, which drinks water by rain from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord are always upon it, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. The Lord cares for the land, even by sending the rain. You know, we, don't take, we take that often for granted. But we often forget how ancient farming societies were so dependent on the rain. One commentator notes, If the rains came at appropriate times, one could hope for good crops, which meant enough food or bread for the coming year. 
and seed for the following year's crop. How without the rain, it could have even jeopardized their very existence. You know, we spoke about last Sunday night about God's rule over creation. How that ecosystem is even so well designed. How the rains don't just water the crops. And in verse 10, we see that once uh, they water the crops, once they're sown, but also they relied on the rain coming, even in the sowing process. Because it actually the rain softened the ground as well to allow the seed to be sown. God waters the furrows, he settles the ridges, he softens them with showers and he blesses the growth. You see, there is an order in God's creation. He blesses the entire year with goodness. The spring, the summer, the autumn, the winter. I don't know when your favorite season is, but it's all ordered by God. And God in his creation provides what we need. He clothes the meadows with flocks, the valleys with grain, and he makes them shout with joy. There's the image of this, the wagon tracks flowing with abundance. It's like the image of the wagon cart coming down, filled with grain, filled with goodness. And as it's bumping its way down the road, it's so full of goodness and abundance that it's even starting to spill out as well too. You know, God waters the land. He crowns the air with his bounty and his his goodness. And as a result of God's goodness, it's as if the land, as one writer uh, talks about, it's like the land's throwing a party here. In these last few verses. Because creation springs up in praise. The grass grows. The flowers, the grains. It's like this creation singing out with joy. But as one uh, one commentator remarks. If this is how God's creation visibly responds to his blessing. Then how much more should we respond with gratitude? If the creation responds by springing up with joy and uh, showing these, the, the grass and, and showing even the, the lovely flowers that grow, then how much more should we be grateful for his mercy? God is good. The children's chorus proclaims that God is so good, but do we take it for granted? You know, as we close, I've mentioned before about the importance of being thankful in difficult times. And it is important for us to do. Paul talked about it often. Often, uh, In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul encourages us to give thanks in all circumstances. That's not easy, is it? Giving thanks in all circumstances. It's easy in the good times, but maybe in a time of trial, it's maybe not so easy. But the challenge is, how do we do that in trying times? It's good for us to pause and reflect on God's grace and mercy. I came across a little article that, where one writer did that. He thought about, you know, how can I thank God even in some of the the trying times of life? And let me read you what they wrote. He said, I'm thankful for the taxes I pay. We don't often thank God for that, do we? He says, I'm thankful for the taxes I pay because it means I'm employed. I'm thankful for the lawn that needs mowing, the windows that need cleaning, and the gutters that need fixing because it means I have a home. I'm thankful for the parking spot I can find, even if it's the furthest away from the shopping mall, because it means I'm capable of walking and I've been blessed with a means of transportation. I'm thankful for my heating bill. If you would say that, maybe would they? But it means I'm warm. I'm thankful for the pile of laundry and ironing because it means I've clothes to wear. Some things to pause and give thanks for. But seriously, what are we thankful for today? Even in the common, everyday things of our life, maybe the everyday frustrations, can you see the good hand of God in that? We have a gracious God who hears and answers prayer. He forgives our sins and he enables us to draw near to him. He's the mighty creator, the abundant provider. The creation responds with thanksgiving, but will we today? Let us pause now and give thanks, even as we sing this final hymn together, and then I'll pray together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks that you are the God from whom all blessings flow. Father, that in our lives, sometimes we don't just pause as we ought to. Sometimes maybe, Lord, in the difficult time or in the, maybe the everyday things of our life, which maybe sometimes we struggle with as well too. Father, just help us to see your grace even in those times. To help us to, to give thanks, Lord, even for the measure of strength even that we have, even to be here today. For even that daily supply of your grace which you give us. Lord, cause us to be thankful. You are the gracious God. You are the mighty creator. And Lord, you are the abundant provider. So Lord, just encourage us with these words. Help us to praise and glorify your name. And may others look at our lives and be able to even thank God for us as well too. As they see evidence of you working in our lives. So Lord, help us in our lives just to be a living sacrifice to give ourselves over to you holy and acceptable to you which is our reasonable service so bless us now even as we meet around the table in jesus name amen perhaps you could turn in your bibles to genesis chapter 22 please genesis chapter 22 Just before we read some verses from this passage. God had tested Abraham by giving him a strange command in this chapter. He was to offer his son Isaac as a burnt offering. That was the son that God had promised to give him. The son of promise through whom Abraham's line was going to continue. The one through whom God's purposes were going to be fulfilled. So what a strange command Abraham must have thought whenever God gave him this. And yet, as he and Isaac ascended that mountain, Abraham tells uh, his son that God will provide a lamb. What test of faith this was as he led his son on that altar. Just as he was about to sacrifice his son, God spoke to him. And let's read verses 11 to 14. But the angel of the Lord, as he was about to take that knife, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place The Lord will provide. As it is said this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The Lord will provide. That's a little phrase I just want us to focus on today. In Hebrew, there's a title of of God mentioned there, Jehovah Jireh, meaning the Lord, our provider. God had provided a lamb to be offered instead of Abraham's son. But as we consider God's dealing with his people through the subsequent generations, don't we continue to see that of Jehovah Jireh at work, God being the provider? Because not only does he provide for Abraham, even when Jacob, uh, Isaac's son, was, was threatened by famine in the land, God provided for him. He had placed Joseph in that position to provide for his people. When Israel would later be oppressed even by Egypt, God, Jehovah Jireh, again provided. He provided a deliverer in the form of Moses. Even in the desert, there was people were at times stubborn and ungrateful. Even to God's leading, Jehovah Jireh continued to provide for them. He gave them bread and quails even to eat. Even when Israel was oppressed by their enemies, God continued to provide. He raised up judges. Through the history of God's people, there's, there's evidence of God's provision. But when Jesus came to earth too, he also cared for people's need. He showed compassion to the sick. He healed. He fed the hungry. 
just as God had done in the desert. But also Jesus was the one who surely was God's most gracious provision. Because like God provided a lamb for Abraham, God provided the ultimate spotless lamb. The one who John would later say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As Abraham brought his only son to that hill, you know, so God brought his son to a hill as well. Only it wasn't Mount Moriah, it was Mount Calvary. As Romans 8 reminds us, He who did not spur his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God himself provided the lamb. You know, for us, harvest services are a good time to stop, to pause and reflect and give thanks for God's provision in our lives. But this table too, as we come around it each week, as we pause and reflect, it too reminds us not to forget God's gracious provision in our lives. Who he has provided, his son to atone for our sin. God is Jehovah Jireh, the one who meets our greatest need. This table reminds us of that. These emblems speak of the means of meeting that need. How our Savior offered his body for us. How his blood was shed to atone for our sin. God is Jehovah Jireh. He himself provided the Lamb. We're going to read the passage together in Corinthians and then after that, Uh, I'm going to ask our brothers here if they would give thanks for the emblems and then these emblems will be distributed. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he is betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for the gift of eternal life through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his body freely on the cross that anyone who believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be around the table this morning in memory of the sacrifice that you gave to us. So Lord, as we take this bread, help us to remember that it was your body that was broken for our sins. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our gracious God, loving and eternal Heavenly Father, this morning we continue to sit around thy throne of grace in our Saviour's precious and peerless name. We thank you, Lord, for this fresh opportunity to partake of these elements that remind us so vividly of the great sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf at that place called Calvary. And Father, we thank thee for the wine. It reminds us so vividly, vividly of the precious shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Help us, Lord, each one to, to say, give, give me a sight, O Saviour, of thy wondrous love to me, of the love that brought thee down to earth to die on Calvary. O oh, make me understand it, help me to take it in, what it meant to thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. Thank thee, Lord, for everything you've done for us. Help us, Lord, to be found faithful in these last days to thee. For we ask petitions, and we give thee our thanks, in our Saviour's precious and peerless name. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for your great goodness, for how this table reminds us once more of that goodness, even in you giving of your Son, how Christ was willing to give of his life so we could be free, how he came to give us life even abundant. Father, we want to give you thanks for his sacrifice, for his life, death, and resurrection. And Father, even knowing that he is the soon coming Savior as well. Father, help us, Lord, to just take that time in our lives to, to pause, to reflect on your goodness. And may this time even around the table serve to do that even each week as we reflect on the, the way you provided even through Christ Jesus. As we take of these emblems, let us never forget, Lord, the significance of them. And so, Father, continue, Lord, even to speak to us, even each week through them. And so, Lord, we give thanks for the fellowship that even that we share around this table. What a blessed thing that is. And Lord, we ask that you would now part us with your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> 